All right, welcome in to the first edition here of the Bobby Carpenter Show. We're going to be taking you all through football season, giving you all the news, nuggets, and notes that you need. Feature my guy, Mr. Big Face himself right there in the screen, Anthony Schleich. Well, it's all on the Big Play Network, so thank you for watching and tuning in today. We love this. It's going to be great. There's a lot of awesome content we've got a chance to get to. I want to start off with, though, before the – third member of the triumvirate, Mr. A.J. Hawk. He had a big event last night, Huge. Uh, Saturday night, out in Dublin, Ohio. Hawks Locks for Tots, helping raise money for the James Cancer Hospital, the Buckeye Cruise, all kinds of great stuff. So got a chance to get back together. It was a 70-themed themes themed party, Schlegs. Oh, you yeah. feel like your, your outfit or costume was able to hit the bill. Did you land the plane? Well, you know <laughs> – so when you when you come up for AJ's event, one, Bob, AJ's been doing this for tw 12 years. So everybody that's out there, you know, kind of Woody Hayes brought it back in the day, pay it forward. And, and that's something that we all try to do. And Tress made a point of that. And AJ is now, AJ and Laura Hawk have now done this for 12 years. I mean, that's a long time opening up their home to 350 people last night to raise, you know, a crazy amount of money for cancer research at the Ohio State University. They're, they're close to almost $2 million. Now, back to my costume. Well, when you're a hillbilly, and it's a 70s theme, I was a hillbilly hippie. That was kind of my deal. So I had jeans. I had, of course, my Rocky boots on. And I had this shirt that I've had for probably the last, I don't know, five or six years that I bought when we did a 70s theme on the Buckeye Cruise. And it's just one of those things where you just recycle the same, you know, the same material over and over again, you know? So... Did it flip the, you know, first off, it wasn't as good as yours because yours looked like you could actually wear that out and it was, it would be appropriate. Mine, I just dress inappropriately all the time for all occasions. So yeah, so I, I, I definitely fit my authentic build, you know, as far as a costume, but you know, what a great evening. It's always in August. So it's a little bit muggy. I was, you know, oh, I was sweaty like, and steamy. Oh. Like, that's the way you like it. But that's how I work out, Bob. I wear Rocky boots and jeans every time I work out anyways. You know what I mean? Those so is. Again, you never know. We were at AJ's house. Like somebody might want to throw down, you know, six hundred pound deadlift right there in the middle of the floor to see who wants to get a bumpy. Guess what? I would, I'd be ready. Hey, did you get enough to eat last night? Because you can push your mic away a little bit. You, you're gobbling that thing up. I know you like to pop the peas and really get in there, but we don't need to just have that thing halfway down your beak like it's a hot dog. I'm learning things here, Bob. Like I had to push the uh, the computer screen back so our heads match though i have a rock skull one of the many nicknames i had sergeant rock but yeah i don't i mean can you hear me vocally through yeah. this like i don't know you know sometimes do i have snare in my headphones dave Chappelle? i don't know so i will back it away and um yeah it was a, it was a great time last night well good i'm glad you had fun it was great catching up with everybody you know former teammates there freddie puggish doug daddish uh zach the born brothers were there born just brothers. looking nice and robust uh very sweaty um, and how about our guy, Doug? I mean, they do the races the night, the races, Doug winning and uh big deal for him. So that was really good. A lot of fun. There's always great stuff there. I mean, heck, Aaron Rodgers has been there in the past. McAfee was there last year. I mean, it is a who's who event in Columbus and it, it's always saddens me Schlegs, cause it's right at the end of summer. And so I, like, this is the last weekend of summer. You got the kids going right. back to school, you know, you got high school football kicking off You have college football. Now they're in the midst of camp, you know, with all of those things happening, uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff. So you know what? Let's throw it and get to hit today's headlines. So a lot of stuff that's happened in college football and the realignment the last three years. It was Texas and Oklahoma going to the SEC. Then it was USC and UCLA last year going to the Big Ten. It seemed like this year was going to be the first year it was going to be quiet. <laughs> Colorado had some rumblings. Dion was making some noise. Maybe they moved from the Pac-12 to the Big 12, but no one thought that was going to be a cataclysmic event. Well, it turned out that it was. And when Colorado pulled the ripcord, it got the corner schools with Arizona State, Arizona, Utah, all joining aboard, saying, hey, we're out of here. And with that, you've got Washington and Oregon now joining the Big Ten. And that's someplace, Schlegs, I think they've wanted to be for a while not just due to the monetary element that's going to be coming, but due to exposure. And you want to be with like-minded programs. Yes. And the reality is in the Pac-12, everybody's lamenting it. And I, I, I'm, miss, I'm going to miss, man, like Cal, Stanford, 
you know, the Apple Cup, Washington, Washington State. You've got the Civil War up there with Oregon, Oregon State. I mean, all these great rivalries. But the thing that stinks is the people in the Pac-12 outside of really the northern schools, you know, the Oregons, the Washingtons, Utah. I don't know if people really cared. You'd see how many people were going to these games. And they had really great products. They made the Pac-12 this year, Schlags, may have the best quarterbacks top to bottom in all of college football. And it's sad that in an era where that's happening, they're not going to be around to be able to reap the fruit of that. So Washington and Oregon are going to be joining the Big Ten next year. Does that make the conference, in your mind, the best in college football? Well, <clears throat> best by biggest, you know. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, the girth is the <laughs> like, see the girth. I mean, expansive. from coast to coast, man. I mean, from coast to coast, you have the most. And I would say this. The SEC has done a good job. They're going to have to expand, I think, a little bit. Um, the Big Ten has done – Bob, this goes back to us in, in, in 2020 talking about whatever that guy was. He, he quit after two years, but uh, everything that they did. Kevin Warren, is that who you're talking yeah, Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I, don't, I don't even want to bring his name up because we solved all of their problems on a whiteboard on Morning Juice. But that being said, they're actually forward thinking in this. And it's like, hey, let's get the eyeballs in the market, the best teams of the Pac-12. Let's bring them in. And to your point, like-minded universities. And now we have a coast-to-coast uh, Big Ten conference. And I think that that competition will breed excellence. The TV money certainly is in the Big Ten. As far as like the biggest and best conference, the money is in the Big Ten. We know that. And so and now as far as like depth of it, I would say, you know, you look at the SEC, the, the, the bottom of that may be a little bit stronger than the Big Ten. But as a whole now in the Big Ten with 18 teams, I think that they have from top down, the best conference. And I am excited for these. And, and, you know, conference expansion is not done. I believe there will be four at some point. I believe that there will be a, a governing body for those four outside of it, because guess what? It's just too lucrative. Now, how they handle that, I don't know. I have an idea, uh, but I, I think that's going to be getting like minds of a Gene Smith, people that understand this, to come together and say, these are the set of rules for these 80 programs. And the biggest thing is you have to understand what type of program you are. This is not going to affect the Mac schools, right? It's not going to affect the Sun Belt schools, nor should it, because the money's not there in terms of TV contracts and eyeballs watching those games. So it makes the most sense for these universities, especially the ones that are of like mind, that have all these different programs to come together and say, hey, man, we want to have a premier conference. And guess what? They got the L.A. market. They have the Washington, the Seattle market. They have the Portland market. They have all the eyeballs on the West Coast are now in the Big Ten. And I think they did say these teams from the West Coast. Well, they've they, added a lot of hemp necklaces and hacky sacks. That's going to be big. All right. I well, mean, it kind of fits into our theme last night of the 70s party. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's sitting in Aston Kutcher's basement, hanging out, a little hacky sack, you know, burning – by burning some grass. I know that that's a very forward thinking, progressive area of the country. Schlags. It's, it's a big deal. I mean, you're bringing that in now. And here's the thing I like about Oregon and Washington. Heck, I wouldn't, I think Utah is even on that plane as well. And when you talked about the depth of the SEC, probably being deeper, people at Auburn think that they can win a national championship. They think that they should win a national championship. South Carolina, they're thinking that, Hey, you know, we'd be, we'd be Clemson last year. Right. We're, we're a couple years away from winning a national championship. And I'm pointing those schools out because historically they've been more mid tier to like bottom half of the of the SEC. Oregon and Washington, they're trying to win national championships. For sure. I'm not sure if Rucker like that's the problem. I think there's probably three or four schools in the Big Ten that, you know what, they would be content if they would be able to get into the conference championship game or maybe even just winning eight or nine games as opposed to are we doing everything that we absolutely can so go out here uh, turning over every rock utilizing every resource to try to win and I, I don't think that there's that mentality at some of the bottom tier big 10 schools I don't know if Purdue thinks that way now maybe they maybe they're starting to get there Illinois didn't for a long time I think that they're getting there with Brett Bielema because he yes, you know Bielema cares man he cares he, does, he yeah. wants to win so he's going there but I think even Iowa push us hard but some of the schools like ah, Northwestern, ah, Rutgers, Maryland, I think they're starting to get there. 
you know, a little bit. Indiana, they're not there. And I don't think they were with Kevin Wilson. Kevin Wilson was grinding. And then all of a sudden Tom Allen comes in and you've just seen the offense slide. But with Oregon and Washington, these are top 15 programs. Yes. And they put a lot of dollars into trying to win. Yep. And, you know, you see that to a prime example – you look at Rutgers over there on the East Coast and their facilities. Do they even hold a candle to what we see at Ohio State or, I mean, Northwestern? You mentioned them. And I will say this about Northwestern. They went to a conference oh, championship just yeah. a couple a couple of years ago, right? And you can do that at schools. You're not going to be able to do it every single year. What has to happen? You have to potentially get a transfer kid now in through the portal that can, especially at the quarterback position, somebody that handles the ball that's really, really good. But you also got to develop guys, and you have to know that, hey, man, every once every five years, if we can get to that game, that's a win for us. But then other than that, it's are we going to be bowl eligible? Now with the expansion of the playoffs, can we get into the playoff? But, again, competition is going to breed excellence. And to me, with all this TV money that's coming into the Big Ten, somebody has to be like, how are you utilizing those resources to build your football program? That, that's what it is because – the football program, let's not kid ourselves, besides football and men's basketball, they're the only ones that operate in the black. So in doing so, how are we building those programs up? Because they feed all the other, other athletic sports that are on your campus. And we all know that. But you have to be able to – the standard is the standard. Are you going to be able to recruit at Ohio State? No, you couldn't. But you should aspire to do so. I mean, that's what was so good about Urban. I mean, you and I played for Trust. The facilities were – ah, Urban came in. Facilities got upgraded and it was automatically like best. we have we okay, have ask exactly, yourself the question. The yeah, he's asking the question, are we the best at this? And if not, if the yeah. answer is no, then the follow-up is why not? Right. You know, exactly. like that's that needs to be the question for all these schools. You look at talking about facilities, Northwestern's invested heavily. And oh, they had man. a great coach there, Pat Fitzgerald, who did a lot and they pushed and they pushed and they improved. You look at Oregon's facilities, you look at Washington's oh, facilities, beautiful. They're, they're gorgeous. They've put money into that. And that's why, consequently, their teams have been good. And yep. they got Michael Penix Jr. out there, Indiana's former quarterback. I mean, he threw for 5,000 yards, man. This dude's all over the place. He's going to be a, a monster with what they're doing. So I love the fact that you brought teams in who – sorry, we talk all the time, the GSF. Yeah, I GSF, I mean, man. They're trying to go get it. The, the thing is, you look now and you look at the remaining schools out there. And, and I feel for these programs – because I can only imagine I've talked to, you know, guys who have played there, you know, whether it's a Washington State, like Ryan Leaf. Dude, you're, I'm, you're the same age watching Washington State and Ryan Leaf, who really had never done a whole lot of anything, basically playing Michigan for a national championship in 97, like in the Rose Bowl. Like that's a big – it was a big deal. And now, like are they – we haven't seen relegation in college football, but essentially this is what it is. You know, I mean, they're – are they going to basically be a part of kind of a mount, uh, watered down kind of Mountain West? You know, same Cal, Aaron Rodgers, who maybe the best quarterback in the NFL or top three. I mean, that's his alma mater, Marshawn Lynch. Like, there's good dudes that have come out of Cal. Yes. And what, what are they playing now? Like, Stanford, that's where John Elway went to school. Like, all these great players. And you go back and it's like, well, what are we doing? And I put it on the school and the fans and the schools because. Dude, you looked at them over the last 10 years. Stanford has always – they've been pretty good. Until the last three or four years, they've fallen off. They were good. But, but who was going to watch them play? Like, how, how can you not care? So what happens to those guys? Well, I think it starts with, one, an AD and a head football coach having an identity and sticking with that and recruiting accordingly. You know, that's the biggest thing. I mean, there is a finite pool of really talented players out there that can, that can – automatically come in and make an impact. There's, then there's another pool of kids that now you can get through the transfer portal that have been developed in other places, right? We saw that, I, I, again, the name escapes me, but the first round pitcher for LSU that went number one, Yeah, he transferred from the Air Force Academy. He, he was one of those guys that was probably underdeveloped, didn't get a lot of looks, went to the Air Force Academy, balled out, transferred LSU, first round draft pick number one overall. Like those – those big schools have to identify that. Like they have to be really good. Their player development and the, their scouts, right, have to be looking for those type of kids that they could bring into their programs. And then also, what is that plan? And I, again, I view college football the way it is now. Why you and I went back and, and did our MBA when I did it when I was a strength coach at Ohio State. 
college football, this was back in 2013, Bob, but 20, but college football is a business. It is Ohio State football LLC under Ohio State Incorporated. Like that's what it is. So if your mind is not set on that, if your mind is not thinking about, hey, how can I get money in a coffer that can that can build interest that we have money or do things that we can allocate funds to pay for NIL, right? To pay for these kids to you know come to our programs. You're, you're already behind. And then you have the facilities. And then you have the experience of the athlete that then culminates to the fan experience. Because I'll tell you this, guess what? If you want more fans to go to the game, have a better product on the field. How do you do that? De players and development of players in a coaching staff. And so if you are one of those schools, the turnover that I see for all of those schools is way too fast because people can't get established. You have to give them a little bit of leeway on those teams, but you better do a really good job of hiring because then the AD should go. I think sometimes they keep their they keep their job too long at those schools because they made a bad hire. Oh, we can just fix it and let them go in two years. But all of a sudden now a new coach comes in with an identity and a scheme. And guess what? He's doing it with players that don't fit that scheme. Right. Well, so those are all the things that you're that you're dealing with. But if you don't have the mindset to run college football in your program as though it's a business, you're already behind the eight ball, in my opinion. Well. And you mentioned too, like you maybe change coaches, you, you leave the AD. Is the AD really trying to win? You know, That's yes, they, hey, he, he can push it on the coach, but we're not as successful as we should be on the field. But the reality is, you're giving the guy the tools, like to have the support of what he needs to do to be able to have success. And so you look out here, the Big Ten sitting at 18 teams, you know, the SEC, you know, quasi Notre Dame involved, you know, right there. They've got some room to get to 20. SEC, they're 16. They got room to get to 20. I think 20 is probably the sweet spot for conferences. I don't know if you can get much bigger than that. No. So the Big Ten has two essentially slots open. People ask, can they kick schools out? They're not going to kick anybody out. Like it, 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 whether they should or not, that doesn't matter. <laughs> but they're not going to. Um, so you're stuck with what you got. It's like your family. I mean, once you're in there, why, why are these schools together? Well, geographically, people got together a long time ago and said, hey, this makes sense for us to all be together. Let's hang out. We'll start this conference and we'll all be good. So if I could give Mr. Anthony Frederick Rodriguez mm -hmm. a little bit of <laughs> leeway here. You mentioned the leeway. From Athens, Georgia, by the way. Yeah. From Athens, Georgia, back yeah. in the day. I didn't even know about it. It's your, it's your fake ID. We'll get – we'll get uh, – Hunter one here soon. He can get slim to go pick him up some booze downtown. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, that's the thing about it. That's your son's age now, okay? So he can go to downtown Jayville. He can get downtown Jayville, pick up some bums, go run through the beer bar and have him buy, buy him some beer and drive around with his version of Stephanie and get into <laughs> nonsense. Um, so think about it. That's your son, okay? 16, oh, 16 years old. Uh, but if you could have two, your, your two dream schools to add to the Big Ten. And let's forget about the second the ACC and their grant of rights and everything else. And let's pretend that Notre Dame is a rational, sound mind that you could have a conversation with and pitch them this. And you could get whatever tools, two schools you want and assume that no one's going to leave the SEC as well. Where do, where would you go with that? And who do you think would be the two best places? Now, let's factor in you know, recruiting, geography, what markets you want to get into. Factor in some academics because everybody at the Big Ten always likes to factor those in too. So of all of those things in aggregate, what would you kind of look at and say, who would the two schools to add this and fill this out to 20, where would we like to go? Wow, that's a great question. It was um, in the rundown. That, that, was, that was an unbelievable question. And off the top of my head, obviously, Notre Dame kind of fits that bill. The problem with Notre Dame is that they have – their own, they, they feel that they have their own TV deal. They can do whatever they want, you know, want with it. They have some power. Um, I think geographically it makes sense. I think academically it makes sense. Uh, so I like that, but I think that Notre Dame wants to go to the ACC because I think that they can, they feel that they can win the ACC as opposed to beating Ohio state and Michigan now, Oregon, right. Washington, USC. all these schools, USC. I mean, which they already have a standing rivalry with. You know, so that makes a lot of sense coming into the Big Ten, okay? Uh, and, again, I think now with the conference, uh, with the playoff system being at 12, I think that you're going to see, you know, significantly more teams from those bigger conferences being able to get in. Oh, they're getting um, – AC Big Ten and SEC are getting at least seven of those slots, if not eight now. That's what I was thinking. For any four, given four. year. 
you got to yep. think the Pac-12 is done. So now you have four conferences. I mean, two and two. And two and two. They'll each probably get two. And then the ACC, the Big Ten and the SEC will gobble up those other spots because they took pick, cherry picked, obviously, the best of the, of the Pac-12. So we got Notre Dame. Where else would we go? Let's let's probably go to the ACC because I'm guessing that's where the be- next best school would be that you would want to that would want to leave that would want to join the Big Ten. Yeah, I mean, well, let's just think about that. I mean, I, I would not. I Miami is a private school. I would actually probably lean more toward a Florida State. Um, you know, I just think I just remember growing up and watching like. Oh, the Seminole come out there on the field like the the fan Osceola, experience, flaming oh spear. Now, what does that do? Tallahassee is the state capital of Florida. Allows you to come and recruit Florida a little bit more. Yep. Which they already do. I'm talking Ohio State already does it, so we got to take Ohio State out of it. But all the other schools that are in the yep. Big Ten, it allows them to come into Florida and recruit that. I mean, you can think of Clemson. Clemson does not want to leave. They are super happy being in the ACC because they feel like they can win it every single year. So. I'm I'm not going with the Miami. They're all the way down south. I, they're fine. They're in the ACC. I kind of like, I kind of like the, I kind of like you know Florida State being that potentially other team because it solely allows you to go in. There's roots in the state of Florida. There's a lot of talent in the state of Florida. There's a lot of talent in Georgia, right? That you can go and get uh, in these southern states, and it's in, in proximity. It's very close. I know you drive straight down I-10. You head north. Boom, you're right in Georgia, right? So yep. it makes a lot of sense from a recruiting standpoint to have a school that is in the state of Florida. And academically, I don't really know. I, there's a lot of people that live around me in Jacksonville that you know go to Florida State. Um, so I'm like, they think it's high, you know, good academics there. So I'm like, okay, why not? You know, so I would say, you know, dream scenario, probably Notre Dame and, and Florida State, just because of you know tradition that is there, uh, and then the proximity of being in the state of Florida. What about you? What are you thinking? So, what are you thinking? It's interesting you say that because Florida State's I, I I'm a huge fan because I think they with what they've done and you know what Bobby Bowden did there, Slags, and yes. like knowing how that was created and watching that brand be built and the run they had through the 90s where they had you know 10 or 11 consecutive 11 win seasons, just yes. unbelievable numbers with what Bowden was able to do. And I mean, you got to think about it. they they've won three national titles in the last 30 some years. I mean, they they're they're good. You know, they're them and Clemson are the only two that have won national championships, you know, in the last 10, 10, 15 years. So in the ACC, so they're there. Florida State's academics, I think, are they're good, but I, they're not as good as Florida's. They're not as good as Miami's. And I think that that's been the one thing that people have said in the Big Ten that might hold them back some. Everything else you said is great because it gives you that panhandle recruiting, and that's huge. I, Notre Dame, obviously, is, is the no brainer. The other school that I – if you can't get a Florida State, if you can't get all the university presidents to agree on that, which maybe you can, maybe you can't. The other thing that – other school I think that they've coveted for a long time, and I think Miami you could maybe put in there too because they're a private school. They have private school. Academics, but they don't necessarily have that big fan base you're looking for. They're a national brand, but no one goes to their games locally. Is North Carolina. You start Petey looking, Pablo, man. Yeah, you start looking about exactly Petey Pablo. Raise it up. She's like, I love that that's where we first went. What is hey, man, I just, re- I just Pablo? remember, I just remember Pablo old done? school in Alcatraz, man. Old yes, school in well, Alcatraz when we were in college. Oh, man, I took what, my visit man, down I t- there. I, t- I took I my shirt they, off and whipped it around my head like a helicopter. When I, when I took my visit, well, quit shaking your leg, man. You're, you're all over the place. The tricky tables rocking around. I'm sorry. Man, it's just saying I get juiced up talking about because I think North Carolina is a great choice, man. I like I'm it. Watching an earthquake over here, uh, but I think North Carolina they play all sports really well. They've yes. got good academics. There's a high GFF, GSF. They're putting money into football. It's a huge brand. They've got good hoops as well, and it's it's one of the best public academic universities you're going to find. And so I think that that would check a lot of boxes. Plus, you look at the areas of the South that are growing, like Charlotte, North Carolina. Huge. Huge Raleigh, do like Durham, Raleigh, that Durham. area right there. Charlotte, North Carolina is picking up steam, and they also have some really good football. And they're going to continue to have more good players come out of there. So, I think if you couldn't get a school in Florida, I think North Carolina is that next state, and they're going to basically give you that Charlotte market, which is booming, and the, the city's growing like crazy. And so is the Raleigh area as well. So, I think that would be the next logical place. So, hopefully, we'll see over the next five years how this works because. Florida State's, they're, they're saber-rattling. They want more revenue. They understand that, hey, 
I think they get 7% of the, of the television revenue because they split it up equally. And they did some branding analysis with all the eyeballs that watch their games. Like, well, we provide 15% of the value, but we're only getting seven. You know, so yeah, you don't have to be a math, math, math major to figure that out that, hey, we feel like we're providing more than we're getting. And so they're going to try to figure that out, try to work through it. In 10 years, though, I mean, you said you think it goes to four. I could, I could see that. I mean, we'll see if the ACC is able to stay together. They're going to have to figure out their TV deal because you have to think they're the the Big Twelve is getting more than the ACC now. Yeah, like I mean that's that's a rough situation if you're Clemson and you're Florida State because you're running at a about a forty million dollar deficit to the Big Ten and SEC while you're trying to compete with them. Yep. So I'm not sure. Ten years. What do you think it ultimately looks like? Four four conferences, own commissioner running the whole thing. I mean, is that where we go with this? Or, you know, man, what would that be? Let's see. Two can't be sixty-four. I don't know. I like even. I like even number. That's why I said eighty. But I mean, there's sixty-four I, teams that even tr- will be trying to win a national championship. That's my question. Like when you get down to it, how many of those teams are going to actually be trying? To win a national shot. That's so what you're saying. I mean, maybe it's like, hey, it's like, hey, are you willing to, you know, are you willing to do what is necessary to go win a national title? And then you, and then it, it becomes even smaller. Well, right? I mean, is, is Texas Tech doing that? Is SMU doing that? Is TCU doing that? Right. And TCU was just in it. Right. So yeah. you can say, yeah, they are. Right. And they're, and again, they're in a hotbed, right? They're in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I remember when I was coming out of high school in Dallas Fort Worth, we had 160 kids go D1 in the DFW area. And I know it's bigger now because there's 6 million people there. Right? Six, there's a lot 7. of them. 7.2. Get your oh math together. That's yeah, why I said when we were there, when I was there, it was five. It's 7.2 now. I mean, it's crazy that is what amazing. the Metroplex is doing. So it's exploding. It's booming. And someone posed this question to me last week. Like in 10 years, do you think Ohio State's really going to be able, is really going to look around and, I mean, you could throw, you know, Florida State, Bama, these other schools that are sitting there, they're thinking, okay, here's our grant of rights. And we're all getting the same amount of pie, even though that we account for probably 50% of the pie. Like, I don't know if it's a sustainable model where they don't look and try to squeeze down some schools that are like, dude, we're giving you $80 million and you're not really trying to win, you're not investing, and you're not relevant enough to really deserve shredding. So I'm curious to see if in 10 years that there's even slices don't start to become asymmetric as they begin to move around with some of the bigger schools saying, we put more into it, we want to get more out of it. Well, then as soon as that does occur, right, then you automatically put those other schools at a competitive disadvantage because they don't, they're not going to get money in. Yeah. Right. I think that's why everybody does the even split right now is because we want you mm-hmm. to be able to go into your program and compete at a high level and make the conference the best. So we're going to divvy it up across everybody. But as soon as, to your point, Bob, it's like I want more of our take because we're at Ohio State and we have 36 sports and we're going to give it to those sports as well. Because, I mean, Gene built, the, you know, the, was it the Schottenstein uh, Center? What's the, the Schoenbaum? Right. Schoenbaum. The Schoenbaum? The show and bomb, right? That's a huge weight room for all the other yeah. sports. I guarantee you down the road, they're going to have another indoor for, for the other sports. They've done a wrestling. They've done lacrosse. They, they've done all these the things. Cabelli, the Cavalli Center. Yeah, the Cavalli Center, the Tennis Center. I mean, they've, they've been pouring money into other sports. Where does that, a lot of that come from? It comes from donors of those sports, but also football, right? So I think that with all these things going on, as soon as people are saying, I want more of the pie that I put in, right? Those other ones are like, hey, you're going to be left out. That might be a second tier, right? So you have the ones that then come together, and that might be a 32, you know, team thing, right? And and then another group, right? So that 80 could go to 40 and then another 40. I, I don't know how it looks, but I can definitely see that once they start seeing how big those brands have gotten, and then you, you basically then take on the NFL model where there's different tiers. There's levels to this. That's the rack's all, right? And again, there's levels to cup football. We all know it's coming about coming up about him and his future 
with Ohio State. So we'll discuss that next. It's the Bobby Carpenter Show featuring Anthony Schlegel on the Big Play Network. All right, like so it came out last week, Gene Smith, after decade plus run at Ohio State, is gonna announce he's gonna be stepping down summer of 2024. You mentioned you know the Cavalli Center, everything he's done, all the upgrades. You know, Andy Geiger did some of it, and Gene has continued to elevate everything um, to a very high level. He's done a fantastic job. I believe was the catalyst for USC and UCLA joining the big. Sure. Big Ten, because I don't know if Kevin Warren was getting that done by himself. No, no. Gene was the driving force of saying, hey, uh, we need to make a move. Everybody else is, and we can't be left in the dust. So he gets that done. He's going to be stepping down. Big hole to fill. I mean, that's this is one of the best, most powerful jobs in all of college athletics. What happens? Where, where do they go from here? I mean, is, is and is there worry, any concern? The man, I mean, it's not the head football coach. But it's pretty darn important. Well, it's super important. Um, I think he has the third longest tenure of any athletic director at Ohio State. And I always call him Coach Gene because he played and he was a GA at Notre Dame. Uh, so he's a coach, man. I mean, he knows what it is to coach. And, again, in in athletics, I think somebody that's at the helm of that, that has played any type of athletics is critical because you understand the coaches, the strength coaches, all the other personnel that are required to run a successful business. And at Ohio State, you have 36 separate businesses that you want to be successful. So I, I want to start off just with a couple of stories, Bob, because you got to have stories about, yeah. about Gene. And, and I got two that they kind of pop to the top of my head. One is that involves you and myself. So Bobby and I, I think it's 2013 and, and, and Bob had uh, money from the NFL to go back and get an MBA. And we had the NFL trust and all these things that they, that they give former players in the NFL to for their education. And I started thinking about getting a master's, especially my MBA, because I saw kind of how college football is going. And I wanted that skill set. And you and I are sitting up there on a treadmill and like, hey, let's do the MBA. We're studying for the GMAT. And I had to get into the Fisher College of Business so I can get an MBA. And I automatically sat down, had a cup of coffee with his beautiful wife, Sheila, and talked with Gene about it. And they wrote a letter of recommendation for me to go into the you know, Fisher College of Business to get my MBA with you, which was super fun. And definitely oh, changed. Gene feels about lying in that letter. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Well, well, that goes into the second story, <laughs> which then which then goes to you know, a year later, maybe a year and a half later, yeah, probably a year later, where I helped a trespasser at Ohio State exit the field safely because he interrupted the football game and that never really happened. And and I, I went out there and, and very gingerly laid him on the ground and, and yeah. escorted him off the field. And, you know, it was it was a big thing. And, and I got hit city of the week. And there was a bunch of different memes that Urban was playing um, you know, in, uh, in, the, in the team meeting room afterward. And it was, it was quite comical. And, uh, you know, my wife and, and Safeco and just making sure we had our umbrella policy all polished up, ready to go in case something happened. And then all of a sudden, I just got this random letter from, from our athletic director, Gene Smith. And, and I, I really don't remember, but it, I still have it somewhere. But in the it's back of my mind, like, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, was, it was more of a, it was more of a, in my own words, not reading the letter, but how I took it was, hey, thank you for your service. Please don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's how I took it. And I was like, thank you. I mean, he could have done, but that's what he did. You know, and, I, and there's a ton of stories. And when you're an athletic director, and I think this is something that, that you have to give credit where credit is due. And they have 
They have, you know, the Buckeye leadership and Bucks Go Pro and all these different programs that support. I mean, there's over 1,100 student athletes at the yeah. Ohio State University. And guess what? Part of that brand is that you build them up and put them into opportunities so then when they're done at Ohio State, they could go on and be successful in their next career, which for some happens sooner rather than later, right? But we all are going to have a second career. And I think that Gene and his family have always been about building up the entire athlete, the whole athlete, whether it's education, sports, and then connections yep. with life after sports. And the beautiful thing about Buckeye Nation is that it's global. They're everywhere. And the internships that all of our student athletes get to do, right, is quite remarkable. And that's something that he prides himself upon. And I get, I guarantee you this. All athletes at Ohio State are better for these different programs that he's brought in. So it's going to be hard that he leaves, but he's left a legacy uh, at Ohio State with all of the facilities, the, the importance of winning, the importance of doing everything possible, like you mentioned before, Bob, to allow our coaches and our athletes to be successful on the field and off. So those are just a, a couple of stories with Gene. Oh, yeah. You know, I know you. I know you got a couple. Well, that's that's the good stuff from Gene. I mean, he, he's him and Sheila. They've always been there. Done a great job talking with us. He came in right as we were leaving. You know, yes. we had one year with him, maybe a year and a half, and you, you saw the transformation because he cared a lot. And he did find a way to get it done. They brought in Urban, and it's like, okay, here we go, and it's time to go. And you look at really, it's not even just football, but you look at what Nick Myers done in uh, lacrosse. Mm -hmm. Look what Tom's done in wrestling. I mean, all the things that they have elevated in the, the women's basketball program. Women's basketball. They've moved – the needle has moved a lot, and it's not just in football, which Gene gets it. That's the driver. We need to have money to fund everything else, so football has to make sure they get it done. So his replacement then, it's going to be a big, big deal. A guy that I'll live, lobby for really hard. And there's, there's Go ahead, Bob. Dinah Sabo just left, and where did she – Utah go? State, I believe. Utah State, yes. Utah State, you've got your friend Heather Like, who's over at Pitt now, who was at Eastern Michigan before <laughs> oh she God. was here under Gene. Um, but really the guy who I love is Pat Chun. He's the AD at Washington State. He was at Florida Atlantic. He's done a good job now. And I can't blame Washington State being left in the wind right now. That's not his, his problem. He was doing the best he can. Good up there, but he's an Ohio guy. He had deep ties. He spent a long time here. He, to me, would be a home run because he gets it how it works. You almost have to have somebody, like you said, Swags, who's a former coach or has ties into this state who understands how the machine of Ohio State football works. And Pat Chun is that guy to a T. He gets it. He is a Buckeye through and through, and he's great at his job. Yes. And so I think he would be a home run for the next 20 years if you bring him in. I mean, again, let's go back to your point of, Bob, of Ohio State, the machine, Ohio State athletics really runs the state of Ohio. I mean, again, there's there's outlier people that happen to root for the team on North. Guess what? You can move there, okay? But if you're in the state of Ohio, he has those contacts. He did it for 15 years here. Yeah. Then he went to Florida Atlantic. Then he went to Washington State. And he really has done a really a, a great job in all of his journeys. But – it's the relationships that he has from his time here, right, that can help facilitate and bring the funds in that are necessary to continue this juggernaut that is Ohio State football. You can, it's difficult to come in and take over that, this job when you don't have any of those contacts or understand the landscape that is, you know, the state of Ohio and everything that Ohio State is about. And I truly believe to you, you know, you need a person like him. I 100% in an agreement that when this does transpire in 24, I would love to see him take on that responsibility. He's automatically going to have the backing of a lot of former players because he was there at practice with us. I mean, he, I, I remember him, you know, dealing with the baseball program and all those, but he has so many contacts and so many great relationships that he has built over time. And he's worked with a lot of people that are already in the building and he knows how Gene worked, right, with, with all those people. So I believe that it would be a very smooth transition. And, again, mm -hmm. when you come into, like, so how smooth. do we continue this? You want somebody that's going to be able to come right in. I mean, we saw it with Ryan Day. Ryan Day saw it. He was with Urban Meyer. He has a, 
you know, an NFL type mind. He's a great yeah. offensive coordinator. He can recruit lights out nationally. He's built a staff around him of people that are really good at his job. And guess what? Gene backed him when those coaches needed a raise. Like, no, I need to have this guy. Gene made it happen. You need a guy like Pat Chun that can come in, understands everything that Ohio State football is about, that can continue that trajectory moving forward as we get into this crazy college landscape in the next five, ten years that we talked about earlier on in the hey, program, Bob. Someone's got to pay for the lap dances for the big guy, Schlegs. We're right there. <laughs> Let's get some uh, – you know what we're going to do now? The thing I love the most. We're going to get some interaction with fans. we got a couple questions. We'll get some fan questions rolling right here. All right, Schlag, since you've just been obloviating so much during the show, we are tight on time. So you've got to keep it tight. Okay. okay? You've got to get it, get it right, get it tight. Question coming in. How did Tress handle you know the motivation playing the team up north? Ryan's lost, you know, the last two times. What did Tress do to make sure that he obviously he turned the tide to make sure that you know the end of the season that you most especially would be proud of our players? It'll come that final Saturday in November. I love the fact that you uh, gave me the wrap it up box, Bob. So, and I want to hear your take on this because you, you have a memory like an elephant. You remember everything. So that being said, I just remember this. I remember spring ball going back and every Saturday we watched each individual quarter of the Michigan game in the winner's manual. Boom. The significance of the Michigan game and how you win the Michigan game, which is running the football and stopping the run. Right, the turnover margin, those key things. We had a Michigan period every practice to beat that team up north. It was always on our mind, and that was just something that he did. And I know that Ryan does this, so I'm excited for this year. I, I, I want to hear your stories, Bob. But sorry, no, that, was, that was from well, Dollar Dog Nick. So we love the question there, and it's uh, it's a great question. You know, and, and Tress, it was funny because I talked to him about it on the cruise and. I, mean, I was terrified to lose that game. I mean, you, oh my gosh. you watched it from afar, but like being in Ohio for a decade, it was good as John Cooper was and all the great players that came through. It was, it was tough. So big deal. Always be present on it. Understand that the toughness element is going to be there. But trust was big on focusing on process. Like, Hey, you don't focus on winning the game, focus on being better than them each and every day and get through there. Um, real quick after this, we got Mike Kallenberg, Asking best pregame speech you've ever heard, Slags. Oh my gosh, Bob. I I don't know. <laughs> I, I honestly, there was probably, I mean, I've heard so many while at Ohio State from us. I mean, AJ is not a talker. I mean, we really didn't get up. Trust, we just came in and, and read the poem, right? Like that kind of got me yeah. juiced. Um, I know JT Barrett had some great speeches before the game uh, when we were here with Urban, but I've never been a huge pregame. This is me personally. I've never been a huge pregame guy. It was kind of like make it short and sweet so we can get out there and do what we're called to do because I was prepared. Like that's that's how I've always gone about it. So as far as like pregame speeches, I really don't know. I would like to hear your take. I mean, possibly Al Pacino's in uh, any given Sunday if we're really going to dive into it. <laughs> you know, like I, Tress was never like no. a big – people are like, what did he say to get you so fired up? I'm like, it would have been disingenuous for him to come in there and like start – throwing his headset and scream because that's not who he was. You know, like he was the same guy. You know, so you want your coaches to be the same on game day as they are all week. Yes. You can't go try to be something you're not. And so he was never this like overly emotional, you know, looney tune of a coach. Like that's not what he was. And believe me, there are coaches we played for that, you know, would get fired up like that. But, you know, I mean, I, I look at that, like Bill Parcells, like, you know, they were mostly just a couple of lines, a couple of thoughts, like Wade Phillips, when I was in Dallas. He's like, you got a star in your helmet. Go play like one. And that, that was that was the, the I mean, honestly, yeah. One year was let the Cowboys ride, and like that, that's the stuff that you would say. And, and I guess at that point, people talk about like getting hyped up and motivated. You know, sometimes you got to get in there and say something. But like, it, it, if it's all the time, it just becomes white noise. Yes. You know? So I I don't remember the specifics of any of that stuff. I mean, my dad used to give great ones in high school. And, you know, a lot of times they're at halftime and you come in and like trying to figure out what the heck's going on. Like let's solve the problem and let's get our minds right to go back out there and take care of business. So that's kind of, you know, kind of how it goes. I wish I had some great answer that there was this unbelievable speech, 
you know, I've heard Urban give some good stuff. You know, Mick's giving some good stuff. Like, it just everybody's throwing it out there. But you remember more of the game than you do, like, the actual moments um, beforehand. I, guess. I mean, I, 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 when you play – when you play – when you play at the Ohio State, when you play in the NFL, like you know exactly who you're playing, who yeah. you're playing for. And Urban always said, "Remember, you know, love what you do, where you do it, and who you do it with." Like that's really all the motivation that you need. Because guess what, man? We go through all this crap together, and Saturdays are the day we get to go out there and let it loose, man, and have fun. The real motivational stuff is when you're on the bench. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's not really like a get in your face. It's like, bro, great call on that. Hey. You know, hey, check for a first crosser. Hey, what are you seeing here? Like that dialogue juices you up because, like, you just know that that your dude put the time, energy, and effort, and we all did it together. But like in the heat of the battle, like that's when you're doing it. Or hey, we need a big site. Somebody, let's make a play right here. It's third and two. Let's get off the field. And boom, Bob, you come in with a sack. And guess what? Boom, purple cobra. All right, or Top Gun high five, and you're off. Like that's that's the motivational stuff to me. It's not at somebody's speech. It's people's actions. I would say this. The one thing I do remember, maybe it's because I was a freshman. It was the gravity of the game. But it wasn't even – I mean, it was even pregame. It was, you know, the captain's talk after the coaches would leave, you know, your pregame meal. And we're playing Miami, you know, the unbeatable team. And you look at all the guys they got, Hall of Famers galore, all pros. I mean, just great team, obviously. And Donnie and Nicky, you know, we weren't supposed to be able to win it. And Donnie wasn't a big talker. And those were probably the ones that are the most – and he was a lot like AJ, and he didn't say a lot. He was like, I've, I've had to hear this crap for the last six weeks. How do we have a chance? He's like, we're going to go out there. We're going to we're gonna beat their effing butts, and we're, that, that's what's going to happen. And if you ain't with it, go back to the room. And then he took he took the plate tray and like threw it in the air and glasses went shattering all over the place. I felt bad for the, the people that had to clean it up. But everyone's like, okay, all right. And like that was, but it was that was three, four hours before the game. You know, we hadn't even left the princess yet. So that was probably uh the one that I just remember because I'm like, man, Donnie doesn't talk. Right. And he seems pretty fired up about <laughs> about this. And then I watch glass shatter everywhere. He kicked the damn thing and it goes. It was crazy. So, yeah, that was a big deal. Um, we got one more question. We'll get through slags. Uh, keep it quick. I know you're a food guy. I'm not sure how into the food in Columbus you are, your memory of it. Unknown stunt man coming at you. Better sea bus fat boy food run. They've got the Terminator. They've got the Bahama Mama, which I believe that's down from Schmitz. Terminators at Thurman's and then uh, the Dagwood, which was at the Ohio Deli, which I think went out of business, which was on like Food Network, all these places to eat. Have you had any of those? I haven't had any of those. I mean, what? if I was going to, no, I haven't. But I don't get out. I mean, my wife cooks every meal, you know, really. But I will say this if I was going like to go, I don't miss a lot of meals, Bob. I mean, you got you to feed this beast, man, if I want to deadlift, you know, a lot of weight. But I will say this if I'm going to go for something, I'm going for breakfast and I thoroughly enjoy DK diner and their donut. Oh pancakes. yeah. That's it's good. Just a thing. And I, 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 I sat again, you guys, I mean, you, if you don't know me, here's a glimpse. I like my, I like my pancakes swimming. I mean, I'll, they need to have light preservers on because I it kind of looks more like a French onion soup. Yes. Like the pancake is syrup the and pancakes. Yeah. It's good. so good. So good. And I mean, it's a small little joint. You just go in there and guess what, man? I just want some pancakes and some eggs and extra crispy bacon, please. Ooh. So I love the Terminator. This I'll tell you a little inside here. Never had the Dagwood. Didn't get a chance to try that. Like the Bahama Mamas from Schmitz. They're really good. Court and I's second date was to Thurman's. Went to Champs oh, first. Nice. She took me to Thurman's. That's probably how I knew my wife was a keeper at that point in college because I had never been there. She's like, how have you never been here? I'm like, well, right. From like, so you're from like, you never like, we didn't go up and go to the German village. I didn't even know where it was. We're driving down there. You got to park on the street and wait at two hours to get food, but it was a delicious burger. And so I will go with the Terminator as my favorite. It's good, especially slags. You're a little hungover. It's so greasy and delicious. And you can smell that thing down. Oh, it's, it's checking all the boxes for you. But man, I had a great time today. Absolutely. Uh, what a little longer show, but you know what? It's all good. Uh, covered a lot of ground we're going to start getting into some more football talk quarterback i'm sure will be named at some point here in the future we'll start getting ready for
for the opening game of the season, the Indiana Hoosiers, with that coming down. Buckeyes are basically done with camp, a little bit left, dragging through this week. So very, very exciting stuff. The season is moving on. It is moving yep. forward. So thank you, sir, for your time, as always. Absolutely, thank brother. You. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. It's the Bobby Carpenter Show featuring my man, Anthony Schlegel, right here on the Big Play Network.